in this news roundup of a week for the 1st of April 2022. The Ukraine war shifts into another gear as Russia moves its forces and the West tries to psych Putin out. And the US splits over whether the parental rights bill in Florida really does mean that teachers should not say gay. My name's Malin Baker, this is The Malin Baker Show. The Times of London reported today that according to a senior government source, so anonymous obviously, Britain is concerned that the United States, France and Germany are pushing Ukraine to settle early with Russia and to make big concessions in order to do so. According to that source, Britain is urging them that Ukraine should only reach a settlement when it is in the strongest possible position and that anything else simply rewards Russia after all for invading another sovereign country and making it therefore more likely to be done again in the future. It's worth noting that the Ukrainian foreign minister denied that foreign powers were pushing Ukraine to compromise, presumably Even if it's true, it's not helpful for it to be known by the people that you're negotiating with. The advice from Britain was probably in the mode that Zelensky wanted to hear anyway, given that he has accused German Chancellor Olaf Scholz of mistakes and suggested that France's President Macron is afraid of the Russians. Whether it's good advice or not remains to be seen, but it is a symptom of how much what he said in the public domain is about the impact that it will have on the situation, not necessarily on whether it's true or not. So, for instance, a couple of days ago, British newspapers were carrying front page stories saying that Putin was being lied to by his military advisers. This came from a speech by Sir Jeremy Fleming, the head of the intelligence agency, who said that fear of his reaction was driving the lack of candour from his closest aides. Fleming said that intelligence had suggested that Putin didn't know that the military was using conscripts and that he was now feeling misled and distrustful. This was rather timely because Russia has just launched its new draft for conscripts and is having to stress that they will not be sent to fight in Ukraine if they sign up. Fleming also had some words about Russia's relationship with China, saying this, A China that wants to set the rules of the road, the norms for a new global governance, is not well served by close alliance with a regime that willfully and illegally ignores them all. He argued that China was exploiting Russia's economic weaknesses to strengthen Beijing's global reach and that Putin was being played as China seized the opportunity to buy cheap Russian oil and gas. All of those things may be true. Maybe. It's certainly consistent with the facts that we do know. But why was that being pushed on front pages of UK newspapers suddenly? Because of a speech, which was a planned event. Was it really telling us what is known? Or was it about trying to stoke the paranoia that Putin might already be feeling, particularly in relation to China? The negotiating power of someone who feels he can't trust anyone around him and he's being played for a fool by his closest ally... Presumably that's a significantly less powerful hand than somebody who doesn't feel any of those things. A number of commentators have been looking at the major Russian retreats from positions around Kiev and implying that Russia is all but beaten, whereas that's not really the situation in some of the areas that they're now moving their attention to. This morning, Ukraine pressed whatever advantage it might have by reportedly making its first incursion into Russian territory to bomb an oil depot at Belgorod, presumably one that's involved in the supply lines to Russian troops. At the time of shooting this video, it hadn't been confirmed by Ukraine as their action, hadn't been denied either. But not everything has been going their way. Apart from the continuing pummeling of Mariupol, which is now predicted to fall into Russian hands within the next couple of days, Zelensky announced yesterday that he had sacked two of his generals, who he described as traitors. What they had done, and what would eventually happen to them, has not been disclosed. There was also a blip in the flawless Ukrainian PR machine, 
When a video came to light purporting to show Ukrainian soldiers shooting Russian prisoners of war in the legs, a contravention to the Geneva Convention. Open source investigators such as those associated with Bellingcat analysed the video and quickly identified that it was located in an area that had recently been taken back into Ukrainian control from the Russians. The weather conditions shown in the video dated it to the time after that had happened. The soldiers in charge were speaking Russian, but several with a Ukrainian accent, and the guns being used were modified in the fashion that Ukrainians are known to do. The various details combined led them to conclude that the video was likely to be authentic and that it shows what it purports to show. Zelensky's advisor, Aleski Arastovich, said that there would be a serious investigation and that excesses by Ukrainian soldiers could not be ruled out. He said that decisive action would be taken against those responsible if it turned out to be true. None of this should be a surprise, by the way. War is horrible and when people have suffered atrocities, they are naturally motivated to towards revenge and the people against whom they take that revenge become similarly aggrieved and so on and so on into a downward spiral of deeply held hatred. This is the consequence. That doesn't automatically make the two sides morally equivalent, but the danger is that both get dragged down to the worst of humanity. It is right in the face of that to hold the expectation of higher standards of conduct and in the spirit of giving credit where it's due. It is relatively heartening that while the mainstream media is clearly and unsurprisingly partisan in this war, this contrary incident was reported and analysed fairly straight by many of them. If only they could bring such commitment to their political reporting. I say this in the week, but certain mainstream outlets noticed for the first time there were some incriminating emails from Hunter Biden that have been found, you know, 18 months after they steadfastly refused to report it. Meanwhile, in other developments, Putin pushed the threat to pull the supply of gas and oil if Western country didn't pay for that oil in rubles. The West refused, believing that in so doing they were calling his bluff, and he seems to have backed down from the deadline of today, while still insisting this requirement will nevertheless kick in. In fact, after its initial precipitous plunge, the ruble has actually regained much of its value, thanks indeed to the higher oil and gas prices that there are. That fact is putting pressure on the West to find new ways to apply financial punishment. One way would be to curb that oil price if they could, which the US might make some contribution with, with the announcement yesterday that Biden was releasing US strategic oil reserves to seek to bring the prices down. This could take the form of a million barrels of oil per day over the next six weeks, which could add up to 180 million barrels from an overall reserve of 568 million. That's really aimed at the price of gas at the pump for American consumers. But still, global oil prices drop sharply on the news. Russian troops have been withdrawing from Chernobyl. And it seems that a number of them are doing so, having been contaminated by heavy radiation poisoning, having been sent into areas where people really shouldn't go, namely the so-called Red Forest. Unsurprisingly, a number of those being withdrawn from the site are reported to be suffering from the symptoms of extreme radiation sickness, according to the Ukrainian nuclear power company Energoatom. Seven busloads of affected soldiers have been sent to the Belarusian Radiation Medicine Centre, according to the Ukrainian news agency. Now, in a minute, we'll get to one of the big issues that has been dominating discourse in the US political sphere and which may well have a major impact on the coming midterm elections. But first, one thing that hasn't gone away is the question of where COVID-19 came from. Now, it's been a while since we discussed the question around the origins of the virus, including, of course, the lab leak theory. 
Some interesting things have recently come to light on all of that. So next week's deep dive video, we'll be looking at some of those. Join me for that at 7pm UK time on Monday. Also, it's the start of another month, so that means it's time for the monthly live stream. It'll be fast, it'll be furious, although probably nobody will get slapped. Probably. I will cover the most topical issues of the moment and, as always, reply to your questions from the live chat. Join me for that one at 7pm UK time on Wednesday next week. Meanwhile, America has been in a very strange and confused place. Unheard of, I know. This time, over a piece of legislation passed in Florida this week, the Parental Rights Bill. Democrats and left-leaning professionals have been clear that this bill is despicable and awful, labelled by them as the Don't Say Gay Bill. They've been talking about what a wicked attack this is on the rights of the LGBT community. So here, protesters are campaigning with messages like It's okay to say gay, and God loves all children, not just the straight white ones. A group of LGBT advocates are suing the state for what the lawsuit states is an unlawful attempt to stigmatise, silence and erase LGBTQ people in public schools. President Biden added to the sentiment in a recent tweet. Every student deserves to feel safe and welcome in the classroom. Our LGBTQI plus youth deserve to be affirmed and accepted just as they are. My administration will continue to fight for dignity and opportunity for every student and family in Florida and around the country. Campaign groups have put up a bunch of billboards with the word gay on them and the hosts of the Oscars, when they weren't slapping each other around, decided to comment by saying the word gay over and over. Now, I look at the detail of the issues that come up and I will take them as I find them. Both political parties in the US are capable of some pretty dumb and occasionally gross things. No reason why the Florida Republicans wouldn't be as well. But this seems to be another one of those pieces of legislation that when you look at what it actually says, doesn't come close to the demonic and terrible outcomes that are being claimed for it. The key points of substance in this particular space seems to be that it bans schools from teaching about sexual orientation or gender identity to children below the age of 10. Now, it says nothing specific about not talking about gay issues for that group. It just basically says don't talk about sex. Full stop. Now, I'm assuming that's not the part held to be especially controversial. I mean, I've been below the age of 10. I'm guessing you have as well. My memory isn't totally sharp that I would claim to remember everything, but I'm pretty sure nobody taught me a single thing about sex until well past that age. Children that age are not sexual beings, so I don't understand why you would feel the need to talk to them about it at that stage. However, if I Google the topic of talking to kindergarten kids about gender, I see that this is indeed a thing for at least some people. Today's parent website says this, Three is also not too young for a child to have a clear sense of their gender identity. Seriously? Three-year-olds? Surely one could disagree with that proposition without being held to be a dreadful conservative bigot. One Florida kindergarten teacher was quoted complaining about the bill like this. It scares me that I am not going to be able to have these conversations with my children because they're going to ask me what I did on the weekend. I don't have to hide that my partner and I went paddleboarding this weekend. Unless paddleboarding is a euphemism I wasn't aware of, I would not have thought that was a problem within the language of the bill as I read it. But again, I don't recall that school teachers at any point in my childhood talked about their partners of whatever sex or gender or species. They taught us maths and English. Some of them well, some of us badly. The second part of that bit of the bill says that after that age, such issues should be discussed in an age-appropriate or developmentally appropriate way. Now, OK, that leaves a bit of a hole in terms of the definition of what would or would not be an age-appropriate way. But surely people aren't campaigning because they want to promote that sex be taught to children in an age-inappropriate way. 
And again, that part of the bill doesn't say anything about not saying gay. When I look back to my own schooling, I remember we had some sex education classes later in senior school and some classes where we discussed wider social issues. I remember those because the teacher made a point of recording the class on a tape recorder, which I only realised later was to protect her, the teacher, against accusations that they might be teaching people's innocent darlings things they shouldn't know. Or, I don't know, getting sex education confused with training or something. It was restricted to lessons about basic biology and then the discussion about wider social realities in, I think, half a dozen themed lessons, just one of which was on this area. No children in that group grew up deprived that I'm aware of. A poll by Public Opinion Strategies that described the bill accurately to respondents without any campaign messaging either way found that 61% of people supported the law with only 26% against. That included self-identified Democrats who supported it at 55% with 29% opposed. Support was markedly higher amongst parents. This was amplified unsurprisingly by right-leaning news sources, not so much by those on the other side. Now, the complaint that has some validity is that the vague wording of the bill could mean that uncertainty means that there's a chilling effect. What if something isn't held to be age appropriate? Which is a fair complaint. There should be better and more specific guidance. It's hard to see that that concern alone justifies the sort of outrage and language that's being used. And of course it doesn't. It's yet another example of where American polarisation is determined to push outrage with both sides pushing it at each other in a way that has become disconnected from reality. The astonishing thing is how much the mainstream media has played along with the campaign language by referring to the bill in news reports as the don't say gay bill. I mean, imagine if Republicans had decided to relabel Biden's Build Back Better bill as, I don't know, the enormous waste of money bill, and the newspapers had started to call it that. You'd think that was an odd way for them to behave. And so it is. As far as I can see, the driving force of this bill is really the phenomenon talked about by Abigail Schreier in her book, about how some American schools are colluding with some of their pupils to get them onto powerful drugs, puberty blockers, without notifying parents, and in some cases treating the parents as adversaries. If you're going to have a bill that says schools are not allowed to do that, and they have to inform and work with parents when it comes to their children, I'm not surprised that that might carry the majority support of most parents. The interesting thing is how far the campaign messaging is carrying the discussion, though. Disney, for instance, a company that is heavily associated with the state of Florida, would, in normal times, actively seek to remain uninvolved with the day-to-day -day politics of the state and of the country. Every American, after all, is meant to love the Disney movies of their youth, which are meant to be based on universal stories. But it seems that the rise of the woke young executives that have been seen in newsrooms and publishing houses has also landed in the house of the mouse. LGBT activists within the company have campaigned for it to become more actively oppositional to the Florida Parental Rights Bill, and that pressure worked. On the day Ron DeSantis signed the bill into law, the company issued a statement. Using the don't say gay label for the bill, it said this, Our goal as a company is for this law to be repealed by the legislature or struck down in the courts, and we remain committed to supporting the national and state organisations working to achieve that. Critics in response highlighted a leaked call that showed Disney employees talking about how they could more actively get gay characters and culture into Disney content, suggesting its newly radical woke agenda was a betrayal of the trust of parents. They also pointed to the fact that Disney is happy to do business in countries that abuse human rights, including those of LGBT people. Is the bill justified or not? Well, who knows? 
The one thing I haven't seen is any kind of data relating to teaching practices in Florida and how and what kids are actually being taught. Clearly, some of the highlighted practices in different parts of the US in relation to transgender discussions has created disquiet amongst a significant tranche of parents. It seems to be well documented that ideological positions are being promoted in ways that would genuinely spark serious discussion. Unfortunately, the party polarisation on the issue immediately renders sensible discussion impossible. Because any individual incident of bad practice will be amplified by the one side seeking to use it to attract political support, and relatively mild bills such as this Florida bill, and if I'm wrong to read it that way, tell me in legal terms what I got wrong on that, get described in ramped up hyperbolic end of the world terms, with the aim likewise of maximising political support. One might suggest that it's not the ideal environment in which to debate the best educational approaches and outcomes for young people. Young people who face, by the way, strong competition in the future from China, which is putting a heavy emphasis on education as part of its route to becoming the dominant world power. If it's going to be done this way, I'm guessing it's going to play into the hands of Republicans, certainly in the short term, That is a choice, of course, a choice that political strategists may have some influence over. We shall see. Will we ever get back to a time when, although we might disagree vigorously on certain issues, we nevertheless discuss those issues, argue about them in plain language and in plain sight? The received wisdom for the last couple of years has been that those days are gone forever, And there's a slew of polls from various groups saying how many of them don't feel that they dare openly say what they think. But I'm slowly gaining in optimism on all this. And that's largely because we're seeing a genuine movement. So a couple of examples. I recently said that the sight of Leah Thomas winning an elite swimming tournament with such an obvious and uncomfortably visible advantage would be the start of a change in attitudes. Because the one thing we've learned in the last year is that with trans women allowed to compete in elite women's sport, we will see increasing numbers of such people, many of whom were mediocre talents as men, enthusiastically embracing their chance to get onto the winner's podium. And this won't hold, because regardless of any ideology you may prefer, people have an intuitive sense of fairness, and some of the results are going to be stark. And that simply can't hold. And so we were about to see another example in the UK this weekend when the transgender cyclist, now called Emily Bridges, was due to probably trance six-time Olympic medalist Laura Kenny. And that was likely because four years ago, Bridges had set a national junior men's record over 25 miles and has had just one year of hormone therapy to reduce testosterone levels. Well, that was called off. The UCI, cycling's governing body, determined that Bridges did not qualify yet, which is a fudge for now, but there was a clear understanding that this needs to be addressed properly. Because they really are faced with all women's sporting records being taken over the period of the next five years, unless they listen to the growing sense that the activists can't simply be allowed to redefine reality. Of course, such questions have also been politicised in the UK, But it's not been simply accepted as a mainstream narrative that must never be questioned. Indeed, UK journalists have discovered the wizard wheeze of asking Labour and other opposition politicians to define what is a woman, to provoke the remarkable vision of watching grown adults squirming and avoiding answering what used to be a simple question. I mean, okay, it's a simple question that has been weaponised. Fair enough. Even so... It should be easy to deal with if you have a modicum of courage and common sense. And indeed, up-and-coming Labour MP Wes Streeting made headlines this week by answering the question, can women have penises? Men have penises, women have vaginas, here ends my biology lesson, he said. That doesn't mean, by the way, there aren't people who transition to other genders because they experience gender dysphoria and we should acknowledge that and conduct the debate in a way that respects those people's rights and dignity. Perfectly respectable, perfectly straightforward, only certain extreme activists would have had anything to say about it and okay, a couple of them did, but largely the world didn't end. Neither because the question was asked, 
crassly though it may have been framed, nor that it was honestly and plainly answered. More and more, voices are openly challenging the idea that issues can no longer be debated because to express a view is in itself an indicator of deep moral failings. Now, okay, the women competitors in those elite sports reportedly feel unable to speak out on their own behalf because it might cost them their place on the team. That has to change. But former sporting greats are rising to the challenge, are doing so with restraint, humanity and integrity, and often to good effect. It's early days. There's a lot of nonsense still in the system, but I really get a sense that the pendulum is swinging back from the slightly dystopian place that it had reached. Maybe my wishful thinking kicking in? Let me know what you think in the comments below. In the meantime, my thanks to the good people who support this channel on Patreon. Right now, I really would not be able to do what I do here, aiming to make three videos per week, focusing on whatever topics are of interest, without that important group of sceptics and freethinkers. If you would like to add your support for the independent, fact-focused and non-ideological content that I aim to produce here, please head on over to patreon.com forward slash Baker. It is always appreciated. Either way, have a great week. My name is Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please share with anyone else you think would also enjoy it. Word of mouth is really important to us. And if you've not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? As the saying goes, that subscribe button won't smash itself. So.